Scrambles detected. <laughs> Made in Abyss is competitive child abuse, where orphans scramble down the world's largest septic in hopes of finally earning their parents' love. Nope. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Set in Chernobyl Island Edition, the city of Orth is populated by the clinically insane Cave Raiders, who define a good time as bleeding from their eyes after taking the stairs, and consider being void as part and parcel of daily life. Ah! In short, life is cheap, rope is cheaper, and everyone wants to know the same thing. What's in the goddamn hole? The masculine urge to jump into the pit of indeterminate depth be like, populated by the primal horror of e-girls, Discord mods, and some weird bunny dog. My straight cat outside! The dangers of the abyss boast an impressive KD ratio. Hey, yeah. If being turned into paste or straight up eaten isn't your vibe, perhaps you'd prefer becoming a paralyzed breeding host to a colony of friendly insects. Don't worry, breakfast in bed comes standard. What was it? But putting aside brain parasites and uh, whatever the hell this is, large ground fissure also possesses a host of environmental hazards that make the zone look like a roadside picnic. Oh, and did I not mention the curse? <laughs> a real, tangible curse that affects anyone who's decided they've had enough of Satan's colon and would like to go home. What's that? A slight incline up of more than 10 meters? <laughs> I hope you enjoy bleeding from every orifice. You see, the abyss functions much like a woman. She'll stab you when you try to leave. <laughs> Big Hole is segmented into several layers, and areas within those layers, with each one possessing different threats, ecologies, and more horrific variations on the ascending curse. However, why do any of this? Are cave raiders under a collective psychosis forcing them to speedrun horrific ways to die? Is there perhaps a rare Funko Pop at the bottom? No, it's because we want squishy balls. Relics are the amphetamine producing children's toys found throughout the abyss which break physics as readily as they fill bank accounts. Not bad. Endless gunpowder to fuel an explosive pickaxe? Sure. Regenerative organic plushie? We sell them by the batch. A bell that stops time? Why not? Relics appear as an eclectic mix of painted easter eggs and ancient Game Boys. Either tools left by an advanced civilization with avant-garde design tastes, or items warped to new purpose by the abyss itself. However, all you need to know is that even rank 1 squish balls go for fat stacks overseas. Which is why we use unpaid child labor to gather them. Because someone needs to pay for the, uh, torture device room. Trust me, the kids love it. Speaking of torture... In this ANCAP paradise of zero child labor laws, we follow Rico. The abyss equivalent of a K-pop stan. And Reg, a rejected Astro Boy design with poor self-confidence. For separate but complementary reasons, Literal Child and Literal Child Robot decide that hanging out at the safe level of 300 meters is not bussin' enough, and escape on a whimsical adventure to reach the bottom of the mythical abyss. So join me as we follow them down inverted spooky mountain, meeting the wondrous tenants within, like Big Milf, Spiky Doggo, Chocolate Doggo, Fluffy Collaborator, and Welcoming Man of Science. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Truly a story of friendship overcoming all. Drag free from the deranged mind of Akihito Skushi, a man whose closet and basement will stay sealed forever, Maiden Abyss began serialization in 2012, receiving an anime adaption in 2017, which upon watching, I was instantly hooked. By seven foot tall Ozen, that is. Please marry me. Thank you. By aligning with the Rothschilds for a small price of some minor subliminal messaging, every frame in Maiden Abyss is rendered in extreme detail and scope. Each scene is a desktop background in waiting. The love and care put into the unique creatures and forms of the Abyss Pussy. mirrored only by the anime's willingness to disturb and unnerve. <laughs> While other anime might play at highly detailed fight scenes or put the focus onto horny posting, ah. Maiden Abyss asks itself a totally different question. What is the face a 12 year old makes when she's being delimbed? <laughs> Pain and suffering is drawn in such a focus to the point of being a fetish. I'm hungry. A strong stomach is almost a requirement with visuals ranging from merely gross That's a to reenactments of I have no mouth but I must scream. The sheer creativity will get a nod of respect in Komora. <sighs> or at the very least, have all parties involved investigated by the local police. That said, this is not an anime snuff film, <laughs> and such scenes are neither consistent nor unwarranted. The Abyss is just that kind of place, where wonders and suffering manifest in equal measure. Through the first season, movie, and then second season, the animation only improves. In only a handful of moments did things notably dip. 
with Season 1 having a few stylized CG monsters. Character designs are also excellent, with human and non-human alike made wonderfully unique. But while you're distracted by Ozen, the premier waifu choice for the discerning cave raider, let me tell you about the real best girl, Kevin Penkin. He is as the childhood friend is to failure. You get nothing! You lose! The doom guy of OSTs, Arthur's fist to DW's face. <laughs> Kevin Penkin is, simply put, a goddamn genius. The composer of Maiden Abyss, and arguably the most important figure in the anime's ultimate success. His music that seamlessly combines synth beats with bombastic string orchestra is evidence that Satan indeed exists and is actively trading for souls. Just saying it's perfect isn't nearly enough. Perfection. With a constantly changing array of instruments, <laughs> musical approaches, and a goddamn entirely self-designed lyrical language, Kevin, through demonic power no doubt, somehow makes it work. Just works. In all anime, the soundtrack is used to match the moment. Like the edges of a puzzle, they frame the scene, evoking our emotion through both subtlety and force. Be it the final twilight of a world long dead or the cracking pain of indescribable loss. Music amplifies our imagination. Kevin Penkin created Maiden Abyss OST around a thematic core of tightly wound mystery and adventure. The childlike awe of the fantastical abyss contrasted against the horrors therein, a soundscape the story matches all too well. Behind her teasing smile and confidence, Nanachi carries a guilt that crushes her beneath its impossible weight. Nanimo! Iremui desires a family denied to her. Prushka seeks only adventure and the love of her father. Rico, Reg, Fapta, the abyss provides for them. Uncaring and unceasingly, the incomprehensible boon of a dreaming eldritch god. And to me, that's what the core of the OST is. Blessings and curses made manifest. <laughs> also, be aware that aside from pure gore, Made in Abyss is a uh, kind of sus. <laughs> of course, grizzled veterans of anime, myself included, are desensitized to such things, like how your grandfather dived through hails of bullets to save his friends during the war, or when you tune out his ranting about how much he hates having to live in Argentina. <laughs> So what I'm saying is, just accept that Akihito has a piss fetish and move on. The Abyss exists in a not-Earth setting, where the invention of soap was greatly delayed. In many respects, the world outside the Abyss seems to be fantastical in its own right, with towering iron-plated cities set in snowy wastes. But ultimately, our focus is on the Abyss itself, and the culture surrounding it, one which has resulted in a class-based system. Or whistle ranking. Bell, red, blue, purple, black, and white in order of increasing moral ambiguity. See, much like your mother, the Abyss has been continuously penetrated for over a hundred years. What started as a collection of treasure seekers and the dispossessed, eventually developed its own culture, nation-state, and quasi-religious beliefs. Similar to the mythical continent of Australia, except it's real. The whistle colour hierarchy also indicates how deep a person is actually allowed to go indicating the state will deny my right to challenge an orb weaver to a fist fight. Literally 1984. Hito. White whistles, however, are a bunch of insane people, armed with the fantasy world equivalent of shoulder-mounted Davy Crockett's. Practical nuke! Individuals who have become a white whistle, a promotion which the state has no actual impact on, are free from depth limits. Probably because nobody can actually stop them. Their status is such that a tiny island nation is considered a major military threat by other countries, and thus have their abilities and armed relics covered by a thick layer of state secrecy. That's classified. Public heroes of Orth, the White Whistles are the crystallization of the madness that grips cave divers. Those who give everything of themselves to uncover the secrets below. <laughs> but let's talk a bit more about characters. Often, anime writers make their villains paper-thin cutouts designed purely oh, to stroke the it. ego of their equally paper-thin hero. I really hate that man. A habit Korean manhwa authors seem entirely unable to break. Oh no, it is the arrogant A-ranker from the famous Animal Name Guild. Here to lose to the hero in one scene. How original. Made in Abyss entirely bucks this trend. Bonedrood, or the White Whistle the Sovereign of Dawn, is perhaps the most well-written antagonist ever conceived. Yeah, his unnerving charisma and complexity makes his every scene enthralling. He is also utterly terrifying, Hoshi. but also tireless, driven, diligent. Bonedrood is the distilled form of human will, 
progress at any cost. Yet, even so, genuine love is not beyond him, despite what we'd like to believe. And that's what makes Maiden Abyss so special, how, ironically, human it can feel. So, let's answer the final question. Is it worth it? Yeah, obviously. But not as a first stop. Maiden Abyss sits uncomfortably close to Boku no Pico in the world's worst choice for a first anime. Even beyond the darker story elements, the gore and the fetish buffet that Akihito serves up requires a thoroughly built immune system. Furthermore, being as objective as I can pretend to be, there are some minor pacing issues, with a handful of scenes feeling a bit rushed. I also personally worry about the show's ultimate ending, as the manga is unfinished and a hard faceplant at the reveal of the Abyss's final secret is all too possible. But ultimately, to those that can stand the ever-escalating darkness, it's worth your time. There are some stories that resonate with you, things which stick well after the credits have stopped and those around you have moved on. Anime is filled with these tales, the ones which linger in the back of the mind. Maiden Abyss will not end happily. It won't have a scene of heroic victory or conquering love, but of bitterness and melancholy. But that is no reason to stop an adventure. Cruel, unfathomably dark, and lined with only the smallest pinpricks of muddy light. That is what awaits at the bottom of the abyss. An end those who seek it don't necessarily deserve, but will receive equally. Prushka, Miti, Veko. They are parts of the abyss's story more than any other. A warm darkness, blessings layered by thicker curses. Because you see, Maiden Abyss understands that the end of a journey is not everything. While the inevitable awaits, the steps we take towards it are our own, as are the moments of happiness amidst the overwhelming, yet wondrous terror. And almost forgotten or not, overshadowed by suffering or pain, of a life defined by abject debasement, it reminds us that those are the moments that matter most. And however few, however small they may be, we should hold them tight in the darkest of places. Well that was a cheerful ending. The abyss being one giant metaphor for depression becomes more and more reasonable each day. But hello there my fellow cave divers. Many thanks for supporting my questionable taste in anime thus far. It's a humbling thing to have so many people subscribe to what is a essentially an unhinged rant channel and I truly appreciate you giving me a chance. Speaking of that chance, after being utterly lost as to what to do, I finally added a reward for my Patreon supporters. An 18,000 word novella I wrote about an urchin girl in the fantasy world equivalent of Detroit. I can now confidently say I'm putting in the effort. Putting a shilling aside, now to the comments on the Saya no Uta video. It is the only VN that I have consistently thought about for a decade. Yeah, Saya has a special kind of staying power. I bet I'll still be thinking about sentient meat in the next decade too. I see Signalis used in your vids quite a lot. Please do tell me you plan on reviewing it sometime later. I neither confirm nor deny anything. But I won't deny my obsession with the game. It's a special kind of story that I can't help but think about. Rose Engine made something very special. That Peter Griffin picture is far more disturbing than anything the novel itself has to offer. Peter Griffin's sire is truly my greatest conceived monstrosity. I fear only what my imagination will offer next. Though seriously, the artist I commissioned did an awesome job. Now, as I have been informed, anime is apparently cringe. Look forward to my new upcoming content of Marvel AMVs featuring Rich Evans.